All right. Okay. All right, Alder, before we start, um, we can start with roll call, um, and then we would just Im immediately move to uh, a motion to reconvene the meeting from our last meeting of October 8th. <clears throat> and then we can move on to um, okay. where some, we were. <laughs> for some reason, my agenda, we only have one item on the agenda, so I would ask that you read it. Or I can have okay. Alder, Alder yeah. Stevens read it. I don't, for some reason, I don't That's have fine. it. I, I can, can read, read it. it. Um, All right. We can start with roll call, though. All right. Uh, welcome to Protection and Policy Special Meeting for November 19th, 2020. Uh, we will do a roll call here. Alder, Alder Stevens. You're I'm here. You're here. We got Alder Lefebvre. Here. You are here. And Alder Vanderleest. You're muted, John. He is here. I am here. Okay. All president accounted for. All right. Um, just need to insert the roll call. <clears throat> There we go. All right. So and we'll now need we'll, motion, we'll need a motion to reconvene. I'll, I'll make a motion to, okay. I'll make a motion to reconvene. Second. Okay, by Lafave, seconded by Stevens. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? That, that passes unanimously. Okay, so now so. we are back to um, item number one consideration with possible action on a request by Alder Galvin filed on behalf of constituent Brenda Stoudemire that the, city, that the city consider taking fluoride out of the treatment process for the city water. The floor is closed and the item is back in front of the committee for discussion. Okay, so again, I will re restate that we, our committee met in July. We also met on October 8th. Uh, I would say a good eight to nine hours of testimony, long meetings. We had a lot of experts on both sides of the fence. Um, I, will, I will state, first of all, um, that uh, this is a very, uh, it's a tough issue. There's really no gray area, it's black or white. Uh, you, it would be nice to compromise if we could, but. It is what it is, but I, I commend both sides for their passion and their zeal to do what they feel is correct in their mind. So with that being said, what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to uh, have Nancy Quirk, who is the director of the Green Bay Water Utility and has 33 years of experience as an engineer in the drinking water industry in Wisconsin, she was recently nominated by the American Water Works Association to sit on the EPA's National Drinking Water Advisory Council. Nancy Quirk will, uh, for the proponents of uh, fluoride or CWF, community water fluoridation, I will say CWF quite a bit tonight. She will answer the questions and if she cannot answer that question per se, she will defer to one of the people, one of her folks. Uh, on the anti-fluoride or against the CWF will be Brenda Stoudenmeyer. Uh, she works for the Madison wa Wastewater Treatment Facility. And as an environmental activist, she is presently involved as a litigant in a Northern California federal court case concerning community water fluoridation. I, the same will go for Ms. Stoudenmeyer. She will answer questions that are directed to her and if she cannot answer the question, she will defer to one of her people. Um, I myself have eight questions and um, the questions will be, I will, when I, <clears throat> when I state the question, initially uh, Director Quirk will answer and then Brenda or Ms. Stoudenmeyer will answer. Question I would flip flop and I'll have Ms. Stoudenmeyer first and then uh, Director Quirk. Um, so I have eight questions. I'm not, I don't have to necessarily do those all right now. I'm going to defer right now to the committee. I'm going to ask Alder Stevens, Alder Vanderleest, and if they have any questions or statements or comments at this time that they'd like to make before I would ask some questions. Anybody? 
I'd like to hold off, Mark, until you uh, answer some of your, your some of your oh. questions I brought forward. You're putting the pressure on. Thanks. Okay. All right, I can deal. Uh, Alder Lafave, anything? Um, no, I like to, uh, yeah, listen to your All questions right. and the answers. Uh, I know you are very good at this, so. Oh, well, I don't know. <laughs> we, I think we leave leave it up to your uh, your expertise. <laughs> You're, you're making me too big here. All right, well, we will move forward then. Um, my first question, it'll be first directed to um, Director Quirk and then Ms. Stoudenmeyer will have the ability to retort. Um, Stella Steen, as far as the time, I'm thinking three minutes, um, if we could. Uh, and that's there, three minutes pardon? for, that's three minutes for our staff member. Well, three minutes for for the for either Director Quirk to answer that particular question, and then also uh, or Ms. Stoudenmeyer to answer as well, or her or her designate on that question. So they may defer. If something happens where we I feel that we need a little more answer, I will allow that. But generally speaking, I will look at three minutes just just to keep it fair for everybody. Is that okay? Um. I have to say I'm not clear, Alder. So right, well, uh, just okay. because, so, okay. So, I mean, I can certainly, you know, do whatever I think is is consistent for the purposes of this meeting. If you want to give people, so if I just do three minutes, I mean, you talked about questions. And so that's the part where you lost me. So maybe what we should do is I'll just get started. Um, Director Court can go first. I'll give her three minutes. Right. And well, then- I'll read the question first. I see. Okay. okay. All, All right. That's it. Alder, before, before we begin, since you are going to be going back between staff and, and um, citizen, uh, I would recommend we just open up the floor. Okay. And, that's and fine. Have it open. Right. Okay. okay. I understand. Okay. I would a motion to open the floor for any, from anybody? Motion, motion to open the floor. floor. Alder Stevens open and seconded by Alder Vanderleest. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All, opposed. all right. Thank you, Attorney Bungard. All right. My first question. Um, uh, give me one second. Oh, okay. Well, let me read the question yes, first. So. I just had to get it up. Go ahead. All right. Uh, some communities in Wisconsin, such as Lake Delton, Hayward, and Berlin, among others, have terminated or are considering terminating their water fluoridation programs. In your estimation, is this due to political, financial, scientific, or other reasons? Director Quirk, you're, you're on first. I am going to quickly defer to Robin Koister, who is the fluoridation expert for the state of Wisconsin Department of Health. Okay. Just state your name. And, uh, Celestine, could you restart the clock on that? Celestine? Anyway, go ahead. Um, go ahead. Okay. okay. My name is Robin Cooster. I have a bachelor's of science degree from Minnesota State University. I've been a re registered dental hygienist for 22 years. And for the past 10 years, I have served as the fluoridation program coordinator for the Wisconsin Department of Health Services Division of Public Health. Okay. Although it's true that some communities have chosen to stop fluoridation, we still have about 88% of Wisconsin residents served by a public water of water and nationally. Robin, so Robin, you're kind of breaking up. Could you receive fluoridated water? Yeah. You're kind of breaking up a little bit. Just repeat that last statement. Um, nationally, the overall trends show a continued increase in the number of Americans who receive fluoridated water. Community water fluoridation is encouraged as a good public health policy, but ultimately in Wisconsin, elected officials at the local level set fluoridation policies. We try to provide education and resources to ensure that those making the decisions are relying on sound, scientifically accurate information before setting or changing policies. But unfortunately, we don't always have the opportunity to educate and inform communities before decisions are made. So from those communities that I've worked with, I can tell you that there are a multitude of reasons why they stop um, optimally fluoridating. 
predominantly what we hear is cost and the need to save money. Um, many of the communities that have discontinued are very small communities, um, 300, 400, 500 um, um, people. Um, and they, they, they often have one person that's responsible for all their public works functions. And they just don't have um, they just don't want to pay the water operator to test water on the weekends, or they're trying to cut budgets to save money. Um, some have really outdated infrastructure, and unfortunately, it was easier to stop Florida to take on a capital improvement project. And then there are some communities where personal opinion and local politics are at play. Um, well, don't have, yeah. Okay. I just, I guess that was my main question. I'll just, I'll, and I, you oh, know, I'll just, I'll just add. Okay. Go ahead. If you want to finish, go ahead. You have another minute. No, but I, did I answer your, did I? Yeah, I think so. You were breaking up a little bit, but I, I just, just wanted to say, make sure. You haven't specifically. Go ahead. Oh, I was just saying that I, I believe you answered it. I we just wanted to know in your, in your estimation why, um, you know, if it was more political or financial, it sounds like it's a bit of a financial setup for some of these communities. So, okay, I'll go with that. that I appreciate your testimony. Uh, Ms. Stoudenmeyer, you, you and your group may answer now as far as, uh, and do you want me to repeat the question? Um, no. So, okay, go ahead. I know with Lake Bolton, am I echoing or anything? No. Uh, you know what, actually, Alder, um, yes. I'm not sure that the last person gave her address. Oh, I'm sorry. Robin? Robin Keister, could you give your address? You can give your I work, work address. The that's... Department of Health Services at 1 West... Yep, 1 West Wilson Street, Madison, Wisconsin, 53701. Thank you. And uh, Ms. Stoudemire, yeah. please also give your address. Sure, 1278 Doty Street, Green Bay 54301. Thank you. So I know Lake Delton, um, they quit fluoridation because their head general manager uh, thought it was really dangerous for their utility. One of the chemical trucks accidentally loaded the chlorine into the fluoride chemical and it made a toxic gas and they had to evacuate. And then also um, one of the employees spilt some of the hydrofluorosilicic acid on their boot and they didn't realize it until it like ate all the way through their boot and started burning their foot. So they thought that it was best to just not use the chemical anymore because not that many people even drink the water. Most of the water was used in Lake Delton for the water parks because it's next to uh, the Wisconsin Dells water park stuff. And some of the other utilities that I've spoken with, um, Jill at Wisconsin, they said that when they removed fluoride, their chlorines stuck better in the water and they were concerned about the health of the citizens. And they said that it was the best thing they ever did was getting rid of fluoride. Um, I've also heard some other utilities when they got rid of it, their lead and copper levels have gone down in their water system. And so from my experience with the other utilities that have gotten rid of it, that's predominantly been you know safety issues and most people don't drink the water most of the water goes for washing cars. A lot of people drink bottled water these days. So they just thought it was unreasonable. It was an unreasonable risk to their staff and also um, some of their citizens. That's all I got. Okay. Are, you, are you good with that? All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Stoudemire. I will keep moving through these questions. And like I said, we'll alternate back and forth just, you know, for sake of transparency and fairness. Uh, are we ready here? Okay, the next question I have are is, proponents of community water fluoridation or CWF espouse its value in protecting the health and safety of their customers and do comply with all statutory and regulatory requirements. 
In your estimation, is this a valid statement? I'll go first to Ms. Stoudemire on this. Can you repeat that question? I didn't right. quite understand it. Okay. Well, I, okay. I was going to say proponents. There will be opponents and proponents. So I'm going to say the proponents, those who want community water fluoridation in the system, they espouse its value in protecting the health and safety of their customers and do comply with all statutory and regulatory requirements. In your estimation, is this a valid statement? Does that make sense or not? Yep. Um, I mean, I, you know, I can kind of gather where you may go with this, but I, I'm just trying to just get can your- I, Can I call in Bob Alcock sure. to answer this? I, I didn't even tell you you might be answering any questions, but <laughs> do you mind answering this for me, please? I, you know, I, 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 my Bob Bocock, 405 North Indian Hill Boulevard, Claremont, California, 91711. Um, Brenda, you, you kind of put me on the spot, but that's okay. You know, I agree with what the alderman started this meeting out with by stating that, you know, it's pretty cut and dry. Um, our belief is that, that any substance added for drinking water that has nothing to do with treatment at all is only added for a medical purpose is just fundamentally morally bankrupt. It's just not something we should be doing as water treatment professionals. I heard the introduction of, of uh, Ms. Quirk. I'm a 40 year member of the American Water Works Association, a California grade five water treatment operator. And I practice nationally with the Aaron Brockovich Foundation, working with community drinking water systems across the country. To answer your question, let's go back to what CDC and the uh, fluoridation people said for almost 30 years. 1.2 milligrams per liter of fluoride. For 30 years, they were wrong and they reduced the dose of water, of fluoride in drinking water because it was actually calling, causing the fluorosis, the, the, water sp or the white spots on teeth. But I'm not gonna get into the science. I believe what the alderman said, this is a cut and dry issue for your community. And to put any substance, you know, it would be equivalent of, you know, let's put potassium in drinking water because it stops heart attacks. You know, where does it begin and where does it end? Everyone in this country, everyone in this world has a basic human right to drinking water and that's drinking water full, um, free of your medication. Thank you. All right, thank you, Can sir. I add? Yeah, go ahead, you got another minute. Um, so NSF certifies this chemical and if you look on the NSF certification, it's uh, contaminated 50% uh, of the batches have arsenic in it. Um, many of the batches have lead aluminum, uh, radionucleotides. So it's not a pure pharmaceutical substance. So they may tote it as NSF certified, but it's not, you know, we should not add any level of arsenic into our water knowingly or some of those other contaminants. And it's best, you know, to, I know that it doesn't exceed the EPA MCL or maximum contaminant for arsenic in those chemicals, but we still should not be adding any amount and even in small doses to our water because of the contaminants in it. Thank you. Absolutely right, Brenda. It's, it's a question of what is, what is safe drinking water and what's regulatory compliant drinking water. And they are not the same thing. Thanks. All right. Thank you both for your testimony. Um, Director Quirk, I will ask this of you and your folks as well. Do you want me to repeat the question? Uh, no, thank you. I believe I have it. And I'm, gonna, okay. I'm going to defer to Dr. Russ Dunkel, the state dentist, to help start this conversation. And um, if he would, please. Okay. Dr. Dunkel? Yeah, and before the timer starts, Mr. Story, did you need me to give my credentials, et cetera, as well as my address? Um, you know what? If you feel it's important, but I, I will, I would state, uh, you know, what I would like you to just state is your name, your address, and it, and what your position is, maybe how many, how long you've been in the field. You can Certainly, that'd be it. fine. That's fine. Okay, I'm, I'm currently the Wisconsin State Dental Director. I've been in that position for approximately two years plus. I've been a dentist for 39 plus years, in clinical practice for 38 years. I have two bachelor's degrees and the doctorate, as well as a residency and several fellowships. I Let's reside, my office is in Warren, Wisconsin. I'm sorry. 
Go ahead. I'm Go sorry. ahead. I'm sorry. I just needed your address. Go ahead. I was just about to get that. Okay. One West Wilson Street, Madison, Wisconsin, 53701. Okay. Go ahead. Now, it's been reported or they've been stating that um, it's unconscionable to add fluoride to the water, that it's a medicine. It's been repeatedly proven that this is not through the court system, that this is not an added medical device. Consistently, it's been said that. Where is the science that states that this is the case? I have not seen it. I have not heard it. It's listed scientifically. Um, it's been vetted multiple times. The World Health Organization endorses it. Every major, every major group within the United States and nationally, both from a medical and dental side, endorse fluoride. And it is not considered a medical additive. It is not considered a drug. And it's similar use in protecting the public health, just as chlorine is. Chlorine is used to disinfect the water. Fluoride is used to protect our children and our adults' teeth, especially those who are in dire need and have severe access to care problems. And that's one of the devastating issues we're dealing with COVID. We had a problem before, it's far worse now. And that's why we need the fluoride in the water. Does that answer your question? It does. Um, the clock wasn't running, but I, I, you got two minutes left, uh, Nancy. Um, or on Director Quirk, anybody else? Johnny, Dr. Johnson, would you like to chime in here? I just think I'm you. Do. Celestine, are you running the clock? Um, yes, I'm sorry, I thought I had. Uh, okay, so well, just, just wait. And I will yeah, wait we're, for we're on pause for a second here. Dr. Johnson to start talking, then I'll start it again. Okay. Is he able to connect? Dr. Johnson? You're muted. He was probably. here for a second. Hold on. Um, I can't, we can't. Yes. You're muted on Just, your device. Dr. Johnson, because you are not muted in, in um, Zoom. Okay, I think I unmuted myself. Okay, hold on a second. Can you? Yes, can okay. hear you. Okay, great, great. Uh, I, I would like to add that we Steve, are all Dr. hearing Johnson, about- Just state oh, your name I, and address. You, yes, I, I, uh, I live at 20 PO Box 2450, uh, Chiefland, Florida. And I am a pediatric dentist of 35 years, private practice, and also a, the president of the nonprofit uh, health group, uh, American Fluoridation Society, I'm the president. I would like to add that this entire conversation is rather uh, humorous in a huge way because everyone here knows that fluoride is the 13th most abundant mineral in the earth's crust. We found out the benefits of fluoride through, through quite by when a gentleman moved out, a dentist moved out to Colorado Springs in 1901 and saw brown stains on the teeth. And he did not know why. Through a series of studies, we discovered after a fluoride probe was invented that those people were getting fluoride at a level of two to 12 parts per million. There was also discovery that in other areas which had one part per million in the water, uh, that also both communities had very few cavities, but in the one part per million, they had little streaks called very mild fluorosis to mild fluorosis. We, were, we found what mother nature was showing us. We replicated it in 1945, replicated mother nature, started fluoridating in paired cities, four paired cities that we stuff, uh, took the natural level of fluoride in the water, adjusted it to one part per million, and other, the control city did not adjust the natural fluoride levels. Cavity rates plummeted 60 to 70 percent. So to say that we are adding something to the water, we are adjusting what's already there to an optimal level where cavities will be reduced by 25 to 50 percent or more and have very good looking teeth. 
So to say this is a drug, as Dr. Uh, Dunkel said, the U.S. courts where the EPA is being sued by the anti-fluoridationists, they've taken it to the courts before. No, it is not a drug. They've sued 108 times trying to stop fluoridation. They've lost 108 times in the U.S. courts. Fluoridation is effective in reducing cavities for everyone, and it is safe. It causes absolutely no adverse health effects in anyone or any group of people. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Johnson. I'm gonna keep moving here. Uh, uh, our next question I will have Director Quirk answer first and then Ms. Stoudemire. Uh, this question is opponents of CWF state that fluoride is a neurotoxin and detrimental to the health of CWF customers. In your estimation, is this a valid statement? Director Quirk. I know there might be some repetition here, but I'd, I'd like to, if you can add anything to, to that with your, you or your folks, that would be appreciated. Sure, there was a recent study that was done, I think up in Canada on some of this. And um, Johnny, do you wanna start with that or Dr. Dunkel? Um, I'll be happy to jump in and then uh, yeah, hand it off to Dr. Dunkel. Uh, at the levels of water okay. fluoridation of, point, of fluoride at 0.7 parts per million, fluoride has not been shown to be a neurotoxin to anyone. Toxicology program, which just came out with its revised uh, um, draft monograph, stated that fluoridation did not have the information, of, they did not have information to show that fluoride at levels of water fluoridation was a presumed neurotoxin. At levels of 1.5 parts per million, it is a presumed neurotoxin, but not at water fluoridation levels. In fact, what you will hear many times from the opponents is fluoride fits in between lead and arsenic as far as a neurotoxin. It's a very humorous uh, comparison because that comes from an EPA table. Also in that same category are caffeine and also ethanol. So fluoride at a high level, ethanol at a high level, alcohol, wine, I'm going to have after this, and caffeine. Too much of things can make you ill. They can be a neurotoxin, but not at levels in water fluoridation. In fact, the maximum allow amount allowed in our water in the United States by the EPA is four parts per million, four milligrams per liter. That is six times what we have in our water. We do not have an issue with this. And Dr. Hardy Lineback, who is on this call, was on the 2006 National Research Council and can attest to the fact that there are three conclusions were that there was only severe dental fluorosis at four parts per million that went away at two parts per million, which is three times that in your water. There is no elevation of, floor, of bone fractures at four parts per million. And there are no skeletal fluorosis issues at that. He signed off on that. There were three. They'll pull out of their information like it's an enzyme inhibitor. Is this, is that. No, it is not a neurotoxin at the level in fluoridated water. Dr. Dunkel? Yeah, I would have to concur. And I know they're going to be referring to the National Toxicology Report. But the key to remember is with that National Toxicology Report, on every page of that monograph. This is what it says. This monograph is distributed solely for the purpose of pre-dissemination peer review and does not represent and should not be construed to represent any NTP determinations or policies. And their levels that they were talking about was greater than 1.5. Kadath, who was in the, um, the Canadian Agency for Drug and Technology and Health, reviewed the green and tail study that they'll be talking about and found mm -hmm. several misrepresentations or several concerns with their research that they felt was flawed. So did you are out of no, time. Okay. Yep. We'll have all we'll have for other opportunity going forward. All right. Um Ms. Stoudenmeyer, um you and your folks, do you need the repeat do I need to repeat the question or you have it? Um, can I please have 
Chris Lorenz to this one. And if there's any time, can Hardy Lineback? Sure. If you got three minutes. So if you Thank folks you. can kind of split it up amongst yourself. So, and Let's then just state your name and address for the record. Chris. Can you hear me now? Yes. Hello? Okay. Uh, yes, Chris Neurath, um, 21 Byron Ave, Lexington, Massachusetts. Uh, yes, the question is, um, what is the current evidence and beliefs about fluoride's neurotoxicity? And I would specifically say developmental neurotoxicity, that is um, harm to the developing brain in the fetus, in the infant, and in the young child. Um, so the NTP report, um, the second revised uh, draft was just released um, a few weeks ago. Um, it basically uh, didn't change anything from the first draft. It is still not a final document, but uh, it's been five years in the make. Don't expect them to change their conclusions. Uh, and it concludes fluoride is a presumed neurotoxin. And it says the evidence is consistent and robust at levels um, above 1.5 parts per million. Um, now, and it says it's it concluded it was unclear below 1.5 parts per million. Now, this is based on 159 human studies, 29 of which they identified as high quality, and that includes the green, the Canadian study, Mexican study. Um, uh, two dozen other studies, high quality studies. Every single one of those studies, except for two, which found no effect, found a statistically significant reduction in IQ or an increase in ADHD. Some of them looked at other, other endpoints. Um, so the issue of what about this? Is it only neurotoxic above 1.5 parts per million? Well, basic toxicology says um, to have a, uh, a, safety, uh, a safety factor, um, but it's even easier to explain than that. Um, that's, these studies, uh, looked, um, they reported the average um, in, their, uh, in their group, the average uh, person drinking the average amount of water. Well, uh, in the United States, the EPA has found the average person drinks, I, I don't know what it is, but, but the higher consumers of water drink twice as much. Okay, so somebody drinking twice as much water at 0.7 parts per million will get as much fluoride as the average person. So in other words, if it's neurotoxic and presumed neurotoxic at 1.5 parts per million, some people are going to be drinking enough water to be getting the same internal dose. So that's the difference between the water concentration and what you actually get into your system and uh, crucial difference. Okay. Thank you, thank you, Chris. Um, I wanted to mention to everybody that, you know, I'm flip-flopping these questions. So you might wanna retort back to some of this. What I would suggest is that at the end of this um, discussion, after we're all done asking questions, I will give both groups one last chance to uh, make, make a three minute statement. Okay, so that's after everything is done. So that way you can write notes and if there's anything you care to refute, you may do that at that time. All right, we're moving on. My next question is, <clears throat> the Center for Disease Control, the Brown County Health and Human Services Department's Public Health Division, the Environmental Protection Agency and the Wisconsin Dental Association, among others, back the proponents of CWF. In your estimation, are these groups accurate in their determination that CWF is beneficial to the health of its users? Ms. Stonenmeyer, you will start and then Director Quirk. Sure. Um, my answer is no, it's not. And I'm going to defer this one to Chris Nidell, my lawyer. Okay. Uh, this is Chris Nidell. Um, Address? 
I guess I guess we're going to start the clock before I even introduce myself and give my. Oh, no, no, that, no, we'll get it back. <laughs> Celestine, could you go back? I'll keep track too. I'm, 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 state, once once you state your name, sure. Martha, I'll, I'll let you know. So my name is Chris Nidell. My address is one five five zero five Avery Road in uh, Durwood, Maryland. And uh, to answer to answer the, the question, I think you have to look at uh, the science on efficacy um, of water fluoridation. And, and what I would say is that while there are studies that support the efficacy of water fluoridation in terms of preventing cavities, there are numerous studies that that question the efficacy or, or in fact, don't find evidence of a relationship between um, between water fluoridation and reduction of DMF, DM, or, or essentially a measure of dental and oral health. So there are cities, for example, that have been studied epidemiologically that have removed fluoride. And in fact, the authors of the studies that evaluated that expected to see an increase in diseased, missing, or, uh, or otherwise cavitied teeth. And in fact, in many of those studies, they did not find such an occurrence after the, the removal of fluoride from the water. There's a number of explanations for that, uh, one of them being uh, the fact that other, the other sources of fluoride may be supplementing what would, would otherwise have been in the water. Uh, there's also the fact that other oral hygiene habits have, have increased along with this increase of water fluoridation. So, the pro-fluoridation movement points to trends that show in water fluoridated countries, the reduction in cavities. Uh, however, the, the, the other point that is often made or, or is often ignored by the pro-fluoridationists is that there are countries that never have water fluoridated and show they exhibit that exact same trend. And so what that would, would indicate is that there is some other confounding variable that's responsible for the benefit that we're seeing to oral health. And there are several uh, explanations as to what those compounding variables could be. Number one, the use of, use of tooth, toothpaste and toothbrushes, including toothpaste with fluoride, uh, the use of dental floss, uh, and honestly, just the use of clean water. So if, we, if we're going back into the early 1900s and we're plotting out the, the dental health of these populations, one of the things that may have been contributing to the, the decayed and missing teeth in those early studies is the, the fact that water contained high levels of bacteria. So as we have improved our water chlorination, as we've improved the safety of our water overall, we may have had increased benefits to dental health because we're not drinking in uh, lots of bacteria that would, that would reside in the, in the mouth and in the, in, you know, in the teeth and lead to cavities. So I think, I think on the question of efficacy, I think there is, the data is mixed. Uh, you can go to PubMed, you can do uh, research on the studies and you can find results that support either conclusion. And I would say arguably studies of the same strength uh, exist to support both conclusions. And I, since we have a little bit more time on the issue of whether this is a drug, um, I, I don't know that, that whether this is a drug is the, is the primary reason to put or not put it into the water. But the, FD, the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, Section 321, defines drug as an article intended for use in the diagnosis, cure, mitigation, treatment, or prevention of a disease in man. And dental caries are a disease. And therefore, oh, while fluoride may be naturally occurring, the use of it in community water fluoridation is by the FDA's own definition, a drug because it's used to treat or prevent dental caries, which are a disease. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Nidell. Uh, okay, Director Quirk, uh, do you want me to repeat the question or? No, no thank you. Um, I'm gonna have, uh... Well, Matt Crespin wanted to start, and then we've got um, a couple other people that want to chime in too. So, all right, just state their name and address, and then we can move forward. Go ahead, Matt. Why don't you start out? Uh, good evening. My name is Matt Crispin. I'm the associate director at Children's Health Alliance of Wisconsin. Our address is 6737 West Washington Street in West Dallas, Wisconsin. I also currently serve as the immediate past president of the American Dental Hygienists Association, which represents more than 200,000 dental hygienists across the country. 
Um, there are numerous studies that show the benefits of community water fluoridation and that um, the impact that fluoridation has. Um, studies ha have been done in places like Alaska um, that showed a 32% difference in decay rates. Um, there's studies done on adults um, done in other countries like Australia where there was a decay rate change in between 20 and 30 percent. Um, I think probably what's most important here and something to keep in mind is there was reference to um, impacts or that can change uh, decay rates, things like toothbrushes or toothpaste with fluoride. Um, drinking water is something that everybody has access to. And I can tell you that in your own community in Green Bay, there are children, there are families that do not have access to fluoridated toothpaste. There are families that do not have access to individual toothbrushes for their own families. Um, and, and we know that many of those are, are due to the fact that our school-based programs like those that the Brown County Oral Health Partnership have are on hold because schools are virtual. So eliminating fluoride is going to impact the most vulnerable population of people in your community, which are low-income children and families in the city of Green Bay and the surrounding areas. So this is a huge benefit to your community that by removing it, you really are doing an injustice to the community at large. Or Dunkel or uh, Dr. Johnson talk about any other studies about decay that they want to share. Dr. Dunkel, you wanna jump in here, please? Sure, to emphasize, yeah, sure, to emphasize the study that, one of the studies Matt referred to is the one in Juneau, Alaska where they did a five-year study after they removed community water fluoridation. And what you also have to realize is they had an active sealant, an active fluoride varnish program at the time that this was being analyzed. And yet, even with those issues, they still were, had an issue with a 30% increase in decay. And what Matt said as well is what we really have to consider now is with the COVID, our Sealess Smile program is practically non-existent. Kids are in school, they're not getting the opportunity to do that. And there are many in the state that came and afford a toothbrush. They're sharing toothbrushes. They don't have access to toothpaste. So removing fluoride from the water system takes away the only literal dental treatment they're going to have and could have for some time. Johnny, I don't know if you want to add anything quick. You got 30 I, I apologize. I had to unmute myself. I just wanted to quick jump back to what was said before about the uh, uh, developmental neurotoxicity of fluoride at 1.5 parts per million being presumed. Uh, let's, let's focus on, we're talking about kids. We're not talking about adults drinking 1.5 parts per million or 0.7 and drinking extra water. We're talking about the studies that have shown no changes in neurotoxicity of fluoride in water. They're numerous. The one from Canada was not shown to do that. No, we're talking about kids. We're not talking about adults. Let's get that straight. All right, thank you folks. All right, I'm gonna keep moving here. Pat, my mouse was not cooperating. Sorry about that. Your mom. My mouse. Yeah, it's terrible. Yes, it was. Oh, well. All right. <clears throat> I'm going to move forward here. Um, actually, there was another question I was going to ask. Uh, I was going to have a director of Quirk and then Ms. Stoudenmeyer, but it's basically talking about some of the groups that back for DUF. I think it'd be, it might be some of the same answers. I'll hold that question in abeyance until, unless I need, if I need to ask that later. But the question I, I'd like to ask right now, uh, some talk exists that dentists in the state of Wisconsin leery of coming forward to state that they oppose CWF for fear of retribution. In your estimation, is this an accurate statement? With that being said, what percentage of dentists support CWF in their practices? Uh, Ms. Stoudenmeyer? Okay. I know about six dentists in Green Bay that do not use fluoride in their practice. A lot of them are switching to the hydroxy appetite toothpaste these days. Um, Hardy Leinbeck, he may be able to talk a little more about his own experience with 
you know, coming forward on fluoride? Hardy, are you on? Pull the clock, Celestine. Yep. Hi, uh, Hardy Lineback, dentist, PhD, professor emeritus from University of Toronto. Yeah, uh, there are a lot of dentists who don't come forward. Dr. Lineback, just give your address then where, you, where you're at. 73 Rainsway in McKellar, Ontario. Okay, go ahead. Sure, there are a lot of dentists who don't come forward. You can lose your license. And that's close to what, what happened to me. If you go against water fluoridation, uh, 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 this is a policy that has been endorsed by licensing bodies. You could lose your license. So the science matters, but you can't bring it forward. Did you know there's not even one study, not a single study that shows that 0.7 parts per million reduces dental decay? Not a single study. Not only that, none of them have ever done a randomized double-blinded controlled trial. Not a single one. Need that before you can even say it works. That's what I have to say. Thank you, doctor. Anybody else, Brenda? I think I'm good on that. You're good? Okay. All right, uh, Director Quirk, do you want me to repeat the question? Otherwise, you can, you and your folks can have three minutes. Yeah, I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Johnny Johnson. Dr. Please Johnson, do, 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 do I need to repeat the question or did you get it? Yes, if you would repeat the question, please, that'd be great. All right. <clears throat> uh, some talk exists that dentists, dentists in the state of Wisconsin and elsewhere are leery of coming forward to state that they oppose CWF for fear of retribution. In your estimation, is this an accurate statement? With that being said, what percentage of dentists support CWF in their practices? Well, let me just let me just state that that is so bogus that you can lose your license over this, and it's that's just nonsense. You cannot lose your license if you say I don't like silver filling and I don't want to do them. Then you won't lose your license over that. You have to do something very egregious to absolutely get your license license taken away from you, and that rarely happens. So if you're practicing outside of accepted standards, then you are getting yourself into hot water. You can do that. But I can sit here and say that I don't, I don't like to do silver filling, so I'm going to do Whiteman's. Am I going to get my license taken away from me? That is not part, part of the licensing pro, uh, process here in the U.S. Maybe it is in Canada. Not aware of it. Not aware of it. But I would have to say that those that were on the very first call, the dentist, they still had their licenses, and they were speaking against it, didn't they? So let me also say that the randomized control trial, which is spoken about by Dr. Lineback, is one that is constantly hit. And randomized controlled trials have been talked about by the Cochrane Oral Health Group. And they have said that they are not feasible and possible to be done. Dr. Lineback likes to say, do a randomized controlled trial, deliver a truck of water to, a, to one community that's fluoridated to another that it's not. You can't do that. Well, I'll give you a bit of inf more information, Dr. Lineback. There has been a randomized controlled trial for fluoridation that has been approved by NIH and will begin shortly. So I will stop with that. There is. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Thank you. I'll turn this okay. over to whomever would like to speak next. Matt Crespin, Crespin, please. Yes, I, I'd just like to share that, you know, um, the, the concept of dentists losing their license because they speak out in opposition to fluoride um, is completely false. There's nothing in the state statutes in Wisconsin or other states that say you have to support fluoridation. In fact, I would say the intimidation is quite the other way around. Um, as a proponent of fluoridation, I have had a complaint filed against my license by Ms. Stoudemeyer, um, as well as two other people on this call. I have had harassment by Ms. Stoudemeyer to my employer, um, to my employees for at least the past five years, maybe the past seven or eight years. So the intimidation factor comes from the opponent and dentists and dental hygienists don't want to have to deal with hiring an attorney 
to refute a ridiculous claim against their license, which is the license that they've been educated to and the, the piece of paper that allows them to do what is most important, which is practice their trade and profession of dentistry and dental hygiene. So I think it's laughable to say that dentists are intimidated to come forward in opposition. One, one quick question of either one of you, you got 15 seconds. I just wanted to know what percentage of dentists supporting CWF are still in their practice? I mean, I don't know if I answered that. I guess Johnny, you, I, Johnny, you put a figure across where they um, worked with dentists and, and fluoride and or um, believed in fluoridation. Wasn't, um, didn't you get a number for that? I just need a, I just need a number, like a percentage. 0.001%. Or, I think three zeros and a 1% of, of dentists that don't believe in fluoridation in the world um, that was done by a survey. Okay, so it's a, it's a small number. A very small number that don't believe in it. Okay, that's all I needed, thank you. All right, <clears throat> like I said, you will all have a chance to, you know, when we end this all up to, to speak and I, I will have other, uh, the other committee members as well as other alders, if they wanna ask some questions, they, they can do that as well. I've, I've, got, I've got two more. Um, the topic of peer reviewed studies often comes up when discussing the CWF issue. In essence, a peer review is an evaluation of scientific, academic, or professional work by others working in the same field. One topic that has been discussed as far as the fluoridation issue goes, as far as the issue goes, is hyperthyroidism due to CWF. Who are the authors of these studies? Have they been peer reviewed and do you feel that they're legitimate? I'm gonna to go to Director Quirk first and then Ms. Stoudemire after. I'll let uh, Dr. Johnny Johnson take this, please. Did you say me, Nancy? I'm sorry. Yes, please, with the thyroid. To, yes, the, the thyroid, um, the thyroid study, uh, two studies actually have you looked at fluoridation and tried to link them to thyroid. And I will tell you that in scientific circles, there are those that have an agenda that's driven. And one is, is uh, uh, from the UK. And the gentleman looked at practices where people were diagnosing or saying that they had thyroid issues. And frankly, totally wrong. It has been totally refuted, and it was a very, very poor study. It was by Peckham, Stephen Peckham, who absolutely actually is the anti-fluoridation person in the UK. He used to lead the effort there. He is definitely from a good university, and that is his strong point. His weak point is his study was severely flawed. There is one from Canada that was also Stated to cause thyroid issues from fluoridated water. And in fact, they were people that if had, they had been treated with iodine, they would have had never. So they, it was a very skewed study and very poor study, and it was, has been shown to be totally inaccurate. There are several studies that have looked at it of good quality, peer-reviewed studies and published and have undergone the peer review of the scientific community because we are the toughest on ourselves when we look at research. And those studies have been, been uh, verified as being accurate and being appropriate and clinically relevant. Do you have names of, of those by any chance? Some of those uh, uh, folks that have done that? I will actually get those for you within just a couple minutes. I'll just have to look All those right. up. I apologize, hey, I don't have them on my fingers. You can use, you can do that at the end. All Dr. Right, Dunkel, then. do you have any other um, words of wisdom with the peer reviewed science here? Sorry, I was muted. <laughs> yeah, as far as the thyroid studies, um, Johnny is definitely more adverse on that one than I am. But as always with any peer review, the true goal of any scientific analysis is to provide an open forum to review the research data and opinions in an ethical and orderly manner. And the one thing I wanna emphasize 
is the fact that my colleagues and I, both at DHS and now continue to review all peer reviewed scientific articles and research on this subject as they become available. If new credible research becomes available that provides new data that supports a change in current policies and recommendations, then we will endorse those new directives in order to serve the public's best interest. And I think that's critical to know. Okay, thank you. Ms. Staudenmeyer, if you get a second, uh, you got three minutes. Uh, do you want me to repeat the question or are you okay with it? Sure, repeat it please. All right, so hold the clock, Celestine. Um, the topic of peer reviewed studies often comes up when discussing the CWF issue. In essence, a peer review is an evaluation of scientific, academic, or professional work by others working in the same field. One topic that has been discussed as far as the fluoridation issue goes is hyperthyroidism due to CW. Who are the authors of these studies? Have they been peer reviewed? And do you feel that they are legitimate? Okay, I'm going to hand this to Chris Nidell, and if there's time, if Chris Nurath can respond. Okay. Uh, sorry about that. I was muted. This is Chris Nidell again. I, I, I think the, the, the thing that needs to be said here is, you know, Johnny Johnson referred to a study from the UK and a study from, you know, one other source. It, it, it's not that there are two studies. First of all, the issue appears to be one of hypothyroidism. Uh, we know that fluoride is a, is a thyroid, attacks the thyroid. And in fact, it used to be used uh, medically. I think it still is used medically to treat overactive or a hyperthyroid. So it, it's used to slow the thyroid down or to, or to, to, yeah, to control the thyroid. And I'm, what I'm looking at right now is from PubMed in a peer reviewed scientific journal, the Indian Journal of Dental Research um, by authors from the Department of Oral Medicine and Radiology in India. Uh, what is a systematic review and the, the, the methods were searching uh, the published peer reviewed literature um, and then doing an assessment of that literature. And what they found was uh, 37 articles which were related to the association of, association of fluoride and hypothyroidism. Of the 37 articles, 10 met the inclusion criteria. So we're not talking about just two studies. We're talking about at least 10, uh, if not up to the total of 37. And their conclusion was from these peer reviewed authors uh, from universities, the present systematic review suggests a positive correlation between excess fluoride and hypothyroidism. This calls the need for further well-controlled studies in this emerging alarming issue. Okay, so it's not, you know, the idea that uh, the studies should be peer reviewed, they are peer reviewed. Uh, the idea is that, you know, that dentists are just going to accept and consider new evidence if it's peer reviewed. These studies are out, they're peer reviewed. What they will do is they will continue to find some fault and some fault and some fault. Yet when those objective researchers have done systematic reviews, such as this one, they find that the evidence supports a positive correlation between fluoride and damage to the thyroid. And I'll, I'll turn, the, turn the mic over. Okay, you got 47 seconds. Um, this, this is Chris Neurath. Could I speak on the thyroid? Question? Sure, you got a little less than a minute. Uh, yes, the NTP report on neurotoxicity also looked at thyroid because uh, hypothyroidism during pregnancy is a cause of, of uh, neurotoxic harm in developing brains of inf fetus and infants. And they identified, um, I don't know the exact number, but a dozen or more, all peer reviewed studies, several of which they rated high quality. And I'd like to point out one of them, which hasn't been mentioned. This was done in Canada using um, the Canadian equivalent of NHANES data, which is uh, very rigorous data collected by their equivalent to CDC. And it found that when iodine, um, when, uh, when pregnant women had, uh, or women had uh, reduced iodine intake, which is very common, uh, there was a strong, uh, uh, a correlation between fluoride and hypothyroidism. 
uh, which would be a, a great risk to the developing brains of any pregnant woman. Um, and uh, excuse me, uh, um, much iodine is fired. very common okay. uh, in pregnant women. Thank you, thank you, Ms. Nurath. Okay, I've got one more question and then I'll defer back to the committee and other alders that might have questions. So my last question for now is, um, Ms. Stoudemire, you'll answer first and then Director Quirk. Opponents of CWF have stated that fluoride is on par with lead and does not belong in our water now that we have the science. Would you elaborate on that claim? Ms. Stoudemire, you're first. You're on mute. Um, can I defer this to Rick North? Sure, did you get, you got the question? Can you repeat the question, please? Okay, the question is, opponents of CWF have stated that fluoride is on par with lead and does not belong in our water now that we have the science. Would you elaborate on that claim? I don't think Rick was ready to take questions, but. Well, <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, yeah. Um, Hello? You still, uh, yes, you still go ahead. ahead. State your name and address and go ahead. Yeah, I, uh, my name is Rick North. Um, I live at 17070 Southwest Rivendell Drive in Durham, Oregon. Uh, yeah, with this, uh, this comparison with lead. Uh, after the green study came out, that was the Canadian study last year, uh, showing uh, lower IQs in kids being linked to levels of fluoride and water fluoridation. Uh, three uh, very distinguished uh, medical professionals came out when they reviewed the data uh, from this particular study, which was a very highly rated study. Uh, what they said was uh, essentially that uh, Dimitri Christakis, uh, who is the editor of the Journal of the American Medical Association Pediatrics, um, after reviewing this, he himself said, he also said, by the way, after reviewing this data, he wouldn't want his wife drinking fluoridated water if she were pregnant. Uh, he also said, that the level, uh, that the effect was similar to lead. Uh, David Ballinger, another very uh, highly respected sci uh, scientist in the US, uh, he said the same thing. Uh, Christine Till, one of the authors of the uh, Green Study, one of the main authors, uh, she said the same thing. The, the total effect here is the same. Uh, and uh, very similar to what they're seeing and what lead could do. So three very prominent people came right out and said, this effect uh, was similar to lead. And I'd like to stop there and turn this over to Chris Neurath, who may have additional comments. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Um, yes, I, I'd like to reinforce, none of these are opponents to fluoridation. Uh, the two doctors are editors of the Journal of the American Medical Association. And uh, when they made the statement that um, it was on par with lead, and that's the neurotoxicity that they were seeing, and not just from the study that they uh, published, but from other studies, um, they also said uh, their preconceived ideas was that this was um, junk science, they called it. They had no idea that there was this science out there until they actually had a paper submitted to their journal and then once they had put it through an incredibly intensive review, that it changed their mind and they realized. So these are not opponents saying it's on par with lead. These are people who are professionals. Now the other people um, are also experts in neurotoxicity. And I'd like to point out Dr. Bruce Lanfear. He is one of the most renowned uh, doctor physician scientists in the field of developmental neurotoxicity. He is the person who is responsible for the CDC lowering their acceptable level of lead in children from his extensive studies on lead neurotoxicity. He has come out and said it is on par with lead. So these are not opponents of fluoridation. 
These are experts in the field. Thank, thank you, Mr. Nurath. Um, uh, Director Quirk, did you want me to repeat the question? Otherwise, it's your turn. I think I got it. Um, one of the things that I, I I'm confused a little bit about because there's no been there's not been any lowering of lead. The lead and copper rule is right now under uh, review with the Office of Mi Business Management at the EPA. Um, and so there's no lowering of lead right now. There's a, but there was only an action level. There was not a maximum count, contaminant level of any kind. So currently there is no lowering of lead levels. But I would like um, Dr. Johnson to address this um, re reference to lead if he could get off mute, please. Can you get the clock on? <laughs> I figured out how to get off of, off of mute. Uh, the, the lead issue is a is a scare tactic. Now, I will say that uh, Bruce Lanfear did good research in lead, but to say that this is over and over again that fluoride is on par with lead that comes from a chart from the EPA on neurotoxins known neurotoxins and they use lead it falls between lead and arsenic now that's pretty scary to say fluoride falls between what else falls between them ethanol alcohol and caffeine so let's let's get real we're talking about something that is being said by someone in lead research that is using it improperly uh christakis is not the editor of jama he's the editor of jama peds and people make errors. Now, excuse me, you might want to get off of mute. Uh, mute yourself, please. The editor of JAMA Peds, and I will tell you that the my daughter is an endocrine, endocrine, uh, pediatric endocrinologist. Her boss is the has been past president of the Endocrine Society of the U.S. multiple times. They say that fluoride does not cause any thyroid or endocrine problems whatsoever. The British Thyroid Association, and uh, along with the British Fluoridation Association, have done multiple systematic reviews, and that looks at all studies that have been done, and it does not interfere. The Australians have done this as well. So has a Mandio in Canada. I looked those up. There are no thyroid issues from fluoride. That is incorrect. To say that it comes from, to say that it comes from fluoride in fluoridation versus in another country like india someone else wanted to comment on that you're talking about high levels we're not talking about fluoridation levels that's that's not apples to apples so let's not go there yeah it's a, it's printed research but it's not on fluoridation water fluoridation there was someone else that wanted to talk uh, chris okay, go i want to just please. chime in on chris no i, I want to no. just chime in go on. no we have a we well, we had time it's our time chris you this is me. Hold on, hold on a second. Matt. Just hold on a second. Everybody, like I said, at the end of this, you can uh, make this a statement. In fact, I'll, I might even make the statement a little bit longer so that we, everybody can kind of get their piece in. I might extend it more to five minutes for both groups. But right now, uh, it's uh, Dr. or it's uh, Director Quirk's time. Matt Crespin. Yeah, I want to just touch on the, um, the study that. Uh, Mr. Nidell referenced in regards to the India study. Uh, I pulled the study up while we were talking here. Um, many of the studies included in that systematic review, the fluoridation levels were upwards of 2.97 parts per million, 11 parts per million, 6 parts per million. In fact, the conclusion which he read was quite, quite accurate. However, there's also after the conclusion a limitation section and it says, due to the sample size and sampling technique, there could be bias in this study. The studies analyzed the usage of water with high fluoride content and have not and have not included to which supply water is specific. So this is again an example of what opponents do. They take bits and pieces of the story and that's what they give you. They don't give you the whole story. I'm happy to share this full systematic review with you because what they count on is you not being able to look at it or analyze it, but that's what needs to be done. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all for those answers. Um, we can go go back now. I'm done. I'm done with my questions for now. Uh, I'd like to defer to the committee 
and other alders if they have any other questions of any of the participants. Um, Mr. Chairman. Alder Lefebvre, go ahead. Yeah, um, I do have one question. Um, we were sent all kinds of stuff to, uh, to reference and look at, and this is in our uh, packet. And in the, one of the things in there, uh, this goes to both, I wanted to know where it came from and if they can clarify a little bit more. The Calvary graph of cavity rates. In there, it's uh, from it's uh, Alberta, Canada, 2017. Decay rates over time in Calgary and Edmonton. Um, it started in uh, the the graph here shows that they did a study in 2004 and 2005, and the projections um, of the cavity rates um, went up completely for both Edmonton and Calgary, and I'm assuming that they both had fluoridation in their systems. Now, Edmonton went up from, I'm trying to read this graph because it's a little hard, it was about 2.5%, uh, and then it went up to, it ended up at, when fluoridation was stopped in Calgary, it ended at about uh, 2.8%. Calgary started at about 1.6, maybe. It's hard to, to read these graphs because it's not, increments are kind of strange. It, that one went up from 1.6 or 7, went all the way up to 2.65. Calgary, and when they stopped, their rate, let's see, got to get this here where they stopped. Um, okay, it went from 1.6. 1, 1. Six or seven, it went up to two point six when they stopped fluoridation. Fluoridation, yes. Although Lefebvre, I was just wondering because it's a pretty prominent study, you know, Calgary and Edmonton, and that. I think mm -hmm. I think both parties kind of know know this, so they're fully right. aware so of it. That's you, I want, right. I want to okay. understand this. I want both to answer this one. Right. Uh, this graph, who, who submitted the graph and where it came from? Mm -hmm. um, this, well, this okay. is me that, but I'm actually a co-author on that published paper that that graph comes from. Do, shall I? Yeah. Shall well, I go ahead. You, you start and then I'll, I'll have other folks. We don't really have a clock on this. I, I'll just state, you know, try to keep it succinct as, as much as you can. Go ahead. Yeah, I'll, it, I'll, I'll, it's very briefly, I, you don't have to see the graph. The study looked at two cities in Canada, uh, Calgary and Edmonton. Edmonton was fluoridated the entire time, had always been fluoridated. Calgary stopped fluoridating. The decay rate went up in both, and it went up, up at the same rate in both. Um, so to say that uh, stopping fluoridation in Canada was the cause for increased cavities is simply it is uh, refuted by the evidence because Edmonton, it went up just as much. So something other than fluoridation was causing uh, decay rates to go up in that part of Canada. So that's that's what that graph is showing. Okay, I'm going to give somebody on the I, other side a chance that, to talk. That was a peer-reviewed oh. paper. What was that? Peer-reviewed? And that was a peer-reviewed paper. Okay. Go All ahead, right. Dr. Johnson. Yeah, we'll and we'll go back and forth if we need to make sure the question's answered. Go ahead. Uh, yes, I, this is Johnny, and I'd like to speak to this. Um, I, Lindsay McLaren is the researcher who uh, did this study, and the first three years after fluoridation was stopped, they were measuring before fluoridation had stopped as well to go up in communities with or without fluoridation. Uh, you have less cavities in communities with fluoridation. So what was done with the graph that uh, Mr. Nurath had presented was they omitted a point at which the uh, data, uh, dental data uh, for cavities was taken in Calgary, but not Edmonton. So they took points from point A to point B in Edmonton, and there was a rise in cavities. 
Calgary had a much lower rate of cavities for various reasons of families, incomes and all. And at a point at which they stopped, they rose 146% in, sec in second graders' teeth in three years' time, 146% rise in primary tooth cavities in a three-year period. Dr. McLaren, has we've spoken on this, and it's absolutely accurate, and she's coming out with another study, which will show even further increases that have happened more than three years afterwards. Three years is usually the earliest you'll start to rise, especially in primary teeth, because as a dentist, you know that the enamel of baby teeth, primary teeth, is much thinner, and so cavities happen much quicker when the acid attacks it than it does on permanent teeth. The permanent teeth didn't show that kind of an increase yet, because it takes a few more years for it to eat through that before you can see it. So that, that absolutely is accurate, that it's accurate that there was 146% rise, and it was fluoridation that was at fault. I was there last year in 2010, in uh, October of last year, when they had a hearing in Calgary uh, from the city council, and Dr. McLaren spoke there as well. And they, uh, opponents, tried to make her study sound inappropriate and false. And she absolutely spoke on her study, defended it, and the city special committee and that was looking at refluoridating Calgary chose to take it to the full city council, which absolutely passed to move on to refluoridating Calgary. There is, when you stop fluoridation, you have major increases in cavities, no doubt about it. Documented, peer reviewed, and published. End of story. It Michael works. Schwartz, you want to do a quickie? Um, yeah, in 12, 12 seconds. <laughs> Well, well, I'll give you I'll give you 20. Go ahead, Michael. Thank you. Hello, my name is Michael Schwartz. I'm the executive director of Oral Health Partnership here in Brownson, in Green Bay, and uh, address is 1245 Main Street, uh, Green Bay, Wisconsin. Um, I just wanted to make sure that the group knows um, Dr. Fred Eichmiller, the lead scientist with uh, Delta Dental of Wisconsin, has also included Dr. Uh, Alder Lefebvre many studies showing that ending community water fluoridation increases uh, caries rates dramatically. So he has looked in Anago, Wisconsin and other places and the science is clear. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, Alder Lefebvre, are you satisfied? Do you, want, do you have anything else? Well, I, I just, I still, to me, a question because the Calvary one, the projection, started out low and it really went up high. I mean, the whole projection one, they were uh, fluoride, using fluoride in their water system was really ratcheting up. And Edmonton went up slower. And Edmonton, when they had fluoridation, and I guess they never ended it, they still went up. So I, I still want to understand this graph because it looks like if you, you... If you use fluoride in your system, you're still seeing increase in the dental um, decay. What do you want to hear from? It, uh, you're seeing it, so. Okay. I, yeah, here's. Did you want to hear uh, from uh, Mr. Neurath one more time? He was the one who wrote sure. the study. Yeah. Um, Mr. Hardy also wrote the study. Who did? Hardy. Okay, well. Yeah, I'll, 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 Is that the one? Well, who who wrote, who wrote who did the study on that? This is it was a critique. Rath. Okay. Um, okay. This is Chris Rath. Uh Hardy Linebeck and I were both co-authors, as were other other people on the paper. Okay. Um, and the, the, the uh, Alderman's interpretation was exactly right. Uh, Edmonton was fluoridated the entire time. Decay rates went up dramatically. Um, the decay rates in Edmonton were higher than in Calgary. Calgary was fluoridated the first part of the period and then stopped. In the, in the part of the period when they were fluoridated, they went up dramatically. So, um, so the, the conclusion that stopping fluoride fluoridation uh, was the cause of the continued increase in calorie, Calgary is, is uh, not really supported by the fact the trend was already there of increasing cavities. 
And so to conclude that stopping it with what caused it to increase after it stops is, is just not supported by the evidence. I'll go the phase, let me know. Say, no, go ahead. As far as the other studies on cities that have stopped fluoridating, the Cochrane Collaborative's review, they are the most respected. Um, that's exactly the type of study that they looked at. They concluded the evidence was poor. Um, poor quality, these are poor quality studies. Um, so many other factors are involved and the Calgary case is a, uh, is a perfect example. Something other than fluoridation was causing the rise in cavities because look at Edmonton. Mm -hmm. It, it rose dramatically. Um, and I'd also just like to correct Johnny Johnson's statement that Calgary got fluoridation again. No, they did not. They have not voted to start fluoridation again. That, that's a, a, an important error that he, uh, he made there. Alder Lefebvre, do you have anything else? You. Are, you, are you satisfied? No, that with was, that? We, yeah, when I could we I'll give you, oh, Nancy, I'll give your group one minute. Go ahead, one, Johnny. One minute. Uh, uh, Alder Lefebvre, I would be happy to get you the information directly from Dr. McLaren, who did the study. Uh, that Mr. Nurath and Dr. Lineback wrote a critique of it, and they were saying that they, her information was incorrect. They did not do the study. That they did, they wrote a critique and they put in lines that did not represent what she had in data. Her data showed that cavities were lower in in, in uh, Calgary, and it's because of family incomes. It's, there's a lot of back factors that go along with that. But she was studying Edmonton too. Both cities were having increases in cavities because of decay rates increasing from what people eat. However, when the cavity stopped in the uh, in Calgary, at a point that had stopped, the cavity rates rose to the level of where Edmonton is. They rose as sharply, 146% increase up to that same level of where Edmonton is. And we don't know if it's going to stop there. It may it may surpass where Edmonton is right now, and that's where this next study is. But Dr. Okay. McLaren, I can certainly get that information okay. from you. And as far as the Cochrane group, I met with the Cochrane group in 2015. Okay. They did not say anything about this study being incorrect. They did not say that. Okay, Dr. That's Johnson. That's totally incorrect. All right, thank you, Dr. Johnson. Um, yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Um, one thing I forgot to mention at the beginning of the meeting that, you know, this, this is a protection and policy committee. You know, we have four members, four of the council members. We have 12 on council. Whatever vote uh, comes forward tonight, whether it's three to one, two to two, four to nothing, whatever, whatever, come, whatever vote is uh, done tonight is advisory, uh, only advisory. It goes to the full city council on December 1st for for final say. So with that being said, uh, the alders and our committee, we, we've gotten so much information on this. I mean, beyond, beyond belief actually. And you get to a saturation point, but I will state that, you know, many of us have taken this quite seriously. We are definitely looking at this and we will look at it for city council, but um, you, can, you can see the tenor of the discussion tonight. You can kind of see how it's gone. Some of the questions that were asked and we're not even done yet. We have a couple more, I'm sure. But I just want to make sure that everybody knows that it's going to be going to the full council on December 1st. And uh, it pro most likely will be pulled so that, you know, people can discuss and make their statement. So Alder Lefebvre, are you satisfied with that? Uh, with your, is there anything else you wanted to ask? Otherwise, I'd ask other committee members and, and Alders if they wanted to chime in. Um, no, that was the one that I uh, wanted to get some clarification. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, both sides kind of, I don't know. So let, we can move it's on. Not, right. It's not easy. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. Alder Vanderleest or Alder Stevens, anything? Alder Vanderleest, you're muted. Can you hear me now, Mark? Yes, yes, go ahead. I'm ready to take the vote. I've heard I've heard 
a massive amount of testimony. I, I hope I heard from local dentists here in town as well. And okay. uh, I'm, I'm ready to take the vote anytime you'd like. All right. Is there anybody else, uh, any other Alders or Alder Stevens, anything else, or would you want to just move forward? I also would like to move forward, but I would like to take this time to thank everybody that came forward and spoke. Yes, we did get a lot of information and there's a lot to think about, which we've been thinking about for the last few weeks. But yeah, I also feel like we're ready to move forward. Okay. I make a motion to close the floor, Mark. All right, that's a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All Aye. opposed? The floor is now closed. All right, committee, what are your wishes? I support removing the fluoride oh. out of the water here in the city of Green oh. Bay. That okay, so my, that... I, I support removing the water fluoride out of, out of the water system. Okay, so that is, is that your motion? Yes, that's my motion. Okay, do we have a second? We don't have a second, that, that dies. Okay, we need another motion. Committee, anybody else? Uh, Remember, this is only- I'm still having a hard time. I'm still having a hard time on this I one. I know you are. This is very difficult. It is very difficult. We, is. We've, take, we've taken is. this all very seriously and there's nothing personal here either. Any, and the way we vote. No. You know, I, I want to let everybody know that we put a lot of time and effort into this, <laughs> so it's not mm -hmm. taken lightly. So regardless yeah. of what is voted tonight, it will go to council. So we, we need a motion going forward. I'd like to re reintroduce the motion that to remove the fluoride. If we could, if I could get a second on it. Okay, there was no second. So then the next motion would be to continue as as directed, that would be that would be the next uh, next step. I'll make that motion. Alder, Alder, if if the, if the committee wants to just continue and keep the status quo, really the motion would be to just receive and place on file. <clears throat> I see. I'll make a motion to receive and place on file. Okay. Second. You'll second that. All right. Yeah. Any other discussion? All in favor, please say aye. Do it one at a time. Alder Stevens. Aye. Alder, um, Alder Lefebvre? Aye. Alder Vanderlees? Nay. I do not support fluoride in the water. Okay. Thank you. Alder Stoyer is um, aye. So three to one. So, All right. So, okay. Item was received and placed on file. Okay. Um, so is anything else, Alder or uh, Attorney Bunger? Nope. Um, at that point, we can move on to adjournment. All right. Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn by Vanderlees. Do we have a second? Second. Second, second by Stevens. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you again, everybody. Thank, Thank you, Mark. for all your efforts yeah. as well. Okay. Yes.